Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the Best Damn Movie Related Show. This is a quarantine zone. Apparently, <laughs> everybody here is sick as hell, except for Mark Ellis, because he is superhuman. We are going to push through it, though, damn it, because... <laughs> People need their movie talk. <laughs> also, here is John Schnepp. Guess who else is not sick? That's me. <laughs> I'm not sick. Boy. Everyone else has been taking uh, Smilex. <laughs> <laughs> also here, Jeremy Johns. Uh, I myself am sick. I'm going to take it easy, and uh, I'm going to give you sexy voice today. <laughs> Oh my gosh, also here is Mark Ellis. I am healthy as a horse. This is my sexy voice. Who wants to go to the bedroom and make some bam bam? <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. Is that what you call it? I call it Bam Bam, John. Back to you. <laughs> All right, Lee, let's get started. What's first? When director Tim Miller exited the sequel to Deadpool, it was reportedly over creative differences with his star slash producer, Ryan Reynolds. Speaking to GQ in a recent interview, Ryan Reynolds finally commented on Miller's departure, saying that all he can really add is that he was sad to see him off the film. Though it was a very diplomatic answer, Reynolds then commented on the passion the entire crew had for the movie, and it did seem to suggest some clashes behind the scenes. Making the movie was very, very difficult. It was the most passionate group of individuals I've ever worked with in my life. And for whatever reason, that mercurial crazy burgoo of people is what made this thing work so well. Not just because I had this vision and I saw it this way and it had to be this way. It worked because we all had that feeling. But there were vaguely scary fights in the post-production process that escalated quickly. Luckily, everybody's grown up and at the end of the day, enjoys and loves each other. John, thoughts on the comments made by Ryan Reynolds about Tim Miller and the behind-the-scenes vaguely scary fights. Well, I mean, what this kind of tells us is that, I mean, our assumption at this point has been everybody was holding hands and singing Kumbaya when they were doing Deadpool, and then just after Deadpool and they started talking about Deadpool 2, that's when they started having some different ideas about which way to go. If Ryan Reynolds is saying this, you know it was probably a little worse than that. I mean, because most of the time they'll never even talk about behind the scenes drama or disagreements and stuff like that. So if he's actually saying this, it probably was. Look, I wasn't in the room. None of us were in the room. But it was probably quite serious. The problem that you get into now is that, like, how did this movie then shake out? Like, if they were in Deadpool, like, just the main movie, the first movie, and they were arguing to the point that Rails is saying things escalated quickly. We, like, people were at each other's throats. I mean... How much, you got to then wonder how much of Deadpool was Tim Miller's Deadpool? And how much of Deadpool ended up being Ryan Reynolds? And how different were their visions going into it? I've never really understood, like you'd think going into a movie, and we talk about this sometimes, if you're going into a production, especially like Deadpool, you would think that your star, who's also your producer and the guy who spearheaded the entire movie in Ryan Reynolds, and the guy they bring on to be the director, Probably, you'd think they would have sat down for a few weeks and made sure they had the same vision. So I never really get it when like producers and directors start to deviate on their vision. It's like, didn't you get this straightened out before the movie started? But look, you can't argue with results. And the results were Deadpool was a awesome movie, the way it ended up. Now, whether that's Tim Miller's version, whether that's Ryan Reynolds, whether they had two completely different ideas, if it really was more Ryan Reynolds, I would be interested to in seeing what Tim Miller wanted to do with that film and how it would have gone. But the end result was pretty great. But I don't know, Schnepp, you hear about this. Like, are, are, are we reading into it too much, like these comments by, by Ryan, Ryan Reynolds, or does it actually strike you that it sounds like there was some significant discord between them? Totally, and that, that's par for the course. So working on TV movies and series and things like that. I've done multiple uh, seasons with the same people. And believe me, it gets, t it gets really rough sometimes when you're all in the same room and you're working together day after day, month after month, year after year, you get into big blowout fights and then you make up. And then you get into another blowout fight, an argument about very, you know, things that when the audience finally sees it, it doesn't matter. Oh, you cut away to this because of this. So these like tiny little battles that then grow into really big blowout fights. So I could see how it escalated in the editing room for Deadpool number one. Movie came out. Everybody's chummy. Movie successful. Let's do Deadpool number two. And some of those same kind of creative differences 
erupted earlier than later. So I think, you know, it, it makes sense. And because this is really Ryan, Ryan Reynolds' baby, like he said in some of the other comments that we didn't talk about, he's been on this for 10 years. This is his rock to push up, you know, the mountain. And it's been rolling over him the whole time. So he's not going to let anybody tell him what he doesn't want to hear. He's kind of like my word or the highway kind of. And it's Ryan Reynolds thing right now. And anybody else who's going to argue with him is not going to work on the thing. That's kind of what I read into it. So, you know, it's unfortunate because both of them probably had to fight creative battles throughout to get the cool thing that we got Deadpool. And we might not have that for Deadpool. too. Yeah, and, and all that behind the scenes stuff, I really believe I just don't want to hear it because as somebody mm. who sees the first Deadpool, that movie made me so happy. And anytime a movie gives me joy, I want to assume that everybody behind the scenes was just high-fiving every day. Like, right. hey, we, we had another great day of shooting today. They're in the post-production process. They're editing. Like, man, editing so much fun. I love hanging out with you guys. Mm. And that's not necessarily the case. But it's, it's a weird balance with art sometimes, whether it's music or comedy or making a movie. Some creative tension can add up and you get more than the sum of the parts. Like Mick and Keith weren't always best friends, but they made some pretty kick-ass music together. And some of that is because they were butting heads to get the best possible product. Mm -hmm. So when you hear these comments from Ryan Reynolds, John, what this tells me is that this was not between Tim Miller and the studio because he's still working with Fox. He right. still has to deal with Fox. Yeah. This is Tim Miller's <coughs> vision versus Ryan Reynolds' vision. And it was a one-on-one -on -one battle every day in the post-production process. And a lot of times they could end up seeing eye to eye, but not enough to go forward with dead pull too right jeremy yeah it is a lot like as a star trek fan when you find out that william shatner and george takei hated each other you're like wait, <laughs> wait what, what are you talking about you know um and uh, i i could see it being a case and this is just my theory and speculation um i could see it being a case where they wanted to springboard off of that energy that the leaked Deadpool test footage got. So like, all right, we need to power through this now. It's mm -hmm. like, well, we have to, it doesn't matter. Let's just do it. We'll, we'll get through it. So they worked it out and they, they clashed, they butted heads, but they, they made a great product. And then it's like going into a summer camp that was hard for people to get through. And then everyone goes home. It's like, okay, that was fine. And then next year's summer camp goes around and then th the stuff starts immediately. It's like, I don't want to do that this time. I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> right. And so then people start stepping off. You know? That's a great point too, mm -hmm. because you could not have had creative tension on the first Deadpool and let that get out to the public. Because right, this yeah. was not a project that everybody was like, oh, it's totally going to be awesome. We hoped it would be. The early advertising looked like it was going to be. But Deadpool, as far as we knew around this time last year, was that awful character that ended up having his milestone shut at the end of right. Wolverine yeah, Origins. Right. So you didn't have the same you know, leash that you had now because we, are, we, we loved the first Deadpool. We didn't know we were going to love it back then. Right. And, you know, if, if it is as bad as it seems like it was between Miller and Reynolds, kudos to Tim Miller and Ryan Reynolds for keeping that right. under wraps because you know, Deadpool through their marketing campaign as everything was just pure fun. Mm -hmm. And if we're hearing about all this negative crap going right. on behind the scenes, I think that probably would have influenced or shaded some of our opinions of the movie when we went in. So full marks to those guys for keeping that under wraps up until totally. this point. Gross. All right, what's next? Speaking of Deadpool, it appears as if the debut movie about the Merc with the Mouth had a surprising connection to the upcoming Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and it has to do with the character of Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Director Tim Miller revealed during Deadpool's marketing campaign that they wanted Negasonic to have powers more suited to her kick-ass name. But before they could make that change, they had to ask permission from Disney's Marvel Studios. Via a report from The Playlist during a Q&A, Deadpool co-screenwriter Paul Wernick revealed that Marvel did give the okay, saying that Kurt Russell's ego, The Living Planet, was the character Fox swapped with Marvel to change Negasonic Teenage Warhead powers. Schnapp, what do you think about the trade between Fox and Marvel for Ego, The Living Planet? Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Ego, <laughs> The Living Planet. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't know how to understand that we live in a world where we can see these characters on a, in a giant movies and stuff. It's so amazing. <laughs> Ego, the living planet. Yes, I guess Fox owned it. Originally, he showed up in a, a, an earlier Jack Kirby Thor comic and then later became more uh, in tune with the Fantastic Four world. Right. So when Fox bought the rights to Fantastic Four, they kind of scooped up all of those characters, Doctor Doom, Silver Surfer, Galactus, and yes, Ego, the living planet. So when... Uh, when uh, Marvel wanted to use Eagle the Living Planet, they had to make a deal with Fox. So what this makes me kind of question or wonder is what else is going on? What other little side trades and deals are going on between Fox and Marvel? And it makes me very excited for perhaps maybe Phase 4, Fantastic Four. Well, I mean, the one thing you got to keep in mind is we're talking about properties. Number one, a property that Marvel was never going to touch. Right. And number two, a property that Fox 
Ego of the Living Planet was never going to touch. So these are small, minor things. But this is the cool thing is that both Fox and Marvel have such a large stable of characters that little things like this can happen. Now, James Gunn, uh, Mark Riley just mentioned this to me. James Gunn just took to his Facebook account to talk about this trade that happened. This is what James Gunn said. When I first pitched Ego as Quill's father, I thought we owned the character. After I had worked out a very elaborate story with Ego the Living Planet as a very important part of the Marvel Cosmic Universe, I learned that we actually didn't own the character. I had no backup plan, and it would be nearly impossible to just drop another character in. Thank God Fox came to us and wanted to make the trade. So apparently, like, this was just very fortuitous wow. at this point. I don't know. Mark, you hear about all this stuff. What do you think about <laughs> oh, it? Oh, I love it because it gives me a chance to talk to John Schnepp about sports. This happens all the time. <laughs> <and I laughs> what is this that you speak of this sports? <laughs> it's training, man. And I love that you hear this behind the scenes. And sometimes you don't want to see the wizard behind the curtain. You just want to think that, of course, the things work out, that work themselves out just naturally. But this reminds me, this is not like a one-sided trade. This isn't like when Herschel Walker went to the Vikings and then the Cowboys got all those... <laughs> those young parts that they ended up making a dynasty out of. This is like when Eli Manning and Phillip Rivers kind of swapped teams because Eli Manning didn't want to play for the Chargers and Phillip Rivers went there instead. That makes sense because neither one was going to be utilized to the maximum potential on those first teams. So when you swap, it ends up working out for both sides equally. This is cool to hear that the studios had this much dialogue. Didn't Phillip Rivers and Drew Brees... Weren't they the ones that got swapped and traded? They did not get swapped. No, the, Drew Brees got traded. Are the traded Chargers, too, right? are yeah. they DC or Marvel? The Chargers. <laughs> Their image. Their image. I know, Jeremy, what do you think? <laughs> well, if we're talking trades, we're talking magic cards, because that's how I can relate to this, Good Mark man. Ellis. Right? This is the way we do it. It's like a Shiv and Dragon for a force of nature. Yeah, <laughs> you're going back <laughs> when Shiv and Dragon was the coolest card you could possibly yeah. get. Um, yeah, it, it really does. Uh, it, it makes me think a couple things. One, there we live in a reality where a big living planet could be in a Marvel movie, and we're all completely okay with it, because there was a point <laughs> yeah. where... At a point, you're like, the Avengers can never happen. It's just, no, like, right. one hero per movie, and then that's what happens, and that is the reality of the situation. There's no way they can they can put more people on there. Then Marvel launches their D-list with Iron Man and the Incredible Hulk. People mm -hmm. didn't care about Iron Man back then. Right. I, it's great that kids are growing up in a time where they're like, Iron Man was always cool. He wasn't. He right. wasn't always cool. No one knew who he was. Right, yeah. no one knew. He was like, oh, I guess, sure, Iron Man. Okay. Um... And then it happens, so I see a world where we can have uh, the, the face from Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask, come into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But what's great is, if these are the trades that we're hearing about, I guarantee you there are like five others that we're not hearing about that we will mm -hmm. then talk right. about in the months to come. And that excites me, is what is actually happening that we don't know yet, because if this is happening, more is happening. But like a good sports trade, like the best sports trades are the ones that improve both teams. Mm -hmm. The teams make a swap, and it actually improves their scenario. It's a win-win. Win. And this strikes me as a win-win for both because, you know, Marvel was never good, probably going to use the powers that were associated with Teenage, uh, Negasonic Teenage Warhead, and Fox was probably never going to touch Ego the Living Planet, so this gave them both something to celebrate totally. about, and that's pretty cool. Well, listen, guys, it is Tuesday, which means it's time for us to talk about what is opening this week, brought to you by our good friends at AMC Theaters. we got a few films opening this week. Today, we're just going to focus on one. Which one is that, Ashley? Fantastic Bees and Where to Find Them. The year is 1926, and Newt's commander Eddie Redmayne has just completed a global excursion to find and document an extraordinary array of magical creatures. Arriving in New York for a brief stopover, he might have come and gone without incident were it not for a nomad American for muggle named Jacob, a misplaced suitcase and the escape of some of Newt's fantastic beasts, which could spell trouble for both the wizarding and nomad worlds. Uh, I am very excited about this film. I have not seen it yet. I'm going to go see it tomorrow night. And look, I am not a Potterhead. I've enjoyed a number of the Potter movies. I, I thought they were, some of them were really entertaining. And I enjoyed them, and I'm curious about this. But so far for me, I think the trailers have been really interesting. I love the cast that they have in this thing. And it just seems to have captured the feel of what those Potter movies were in the first place that a lot of people love. That doesn't guarantee anything, but I am looking forward to it personally. So what about you, Jeremy? Oh uh, Yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed the Harry Potter movies until I read the books, and I loved the books, and that's what sucked me into the Harry Potter world. So, And the books explore a lot of the lore and the universe and the world that's built into it more than the movies do. So that, knowing that, that gets me excited for this because I want to know more of this continent and right. what we're doing with magic over here in America and how it all kind of intertwines. I want to see a lot of that. So I mean, how can I not be excited for 
for Fantastic Beasts. I am. Ship. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to it. I'm seeing it tomorrow, too. Um, yep. I'm actually looking more forward to this than the last three Harry Potters because, to me, with Voldemort and Harry Potter, I've, I, you kind of like, look, they're going to fight at the end. When Can we just get to that? At least with this, <laughs> it's a brand new territory. I don't know. It's like, it's like you know, the 1940s. Instead of Tommy guns, they've got wands. There's all these dudes walking around. It's like, <laughs> it's this all new world. So, to me, it's really exciting. Yeah, and something like this, if you're a Harry Potter <coughs> fan, you need to go see this movie. You just do. I mean, it, it's coming back out. It's in the same universe. It takes place 70 years before the events of Harry Potter. You want to feel that magic again. Now, as somebody who has seen the movie, I was never the biggest Harry Potter fan, but I really liked the movies. I thought, personally, it was a little flat, but that's me. I still enjoyed watching a lot of it. It just didn't have the same magic to me anyway. Maybe it's going to be different for y'all. You know what I thought was interesting is that I, I, I think you are really talented at expressing and articulating your thoughts on movies. Oh, well, thank and, you. And hearing that, you know, it, it kind of underwhelmed you, this one. Yeah. I was really surprised and when I got together with uh, Christian Harloff last mm -hmm. night, and his first thing to me was, I really like that movie. So, like, Harloff, I, I just thought I found it interesting. Harloff really liked Fantastic Beasts. You guys didn't see it together, though, did you? No, we did not. There's going to be some creative tension when we <laughs> shoot that for you. <laughs> well, I'm curious because the biggest Potterheads in the room are actually sitting over at Yon Table. <laughs> Ashley, I'm just curious. If somebody's yeah. really into Potter, like, where's your excitement level right now? Are you more worried? Are you more excited? Where are you at right no, now? No, I'm still really, really excited. And all this um, news that we're getting with the follow ups and stuff, it's making me even more more excited. Um, the one thing that worries me is Mark's like re re thoughts on it, I guess. But I'm Christian just one is still dude, me man. Help. I'm just one dude. You are just one dude. <laughs> what do you think, Wendy? <laughs> I'm so excited for it. I mean, it bumped me out a little bit that someone that uh, I know doesn't like it. But again, it's, it's an opinion. So <laughs> blaming Mark. You can say his name. It's all Mark's Wendy, fault. you can say his name. It's it's Mark Ellis no. is the one. He's <laughs> flat. He is he, he <laughs> shall not be named. <laughs> Look, I, everybody has different tastes in movies. You should go see. I gave 13 hours, five out of five schmoes, okay? I may not be the most trustworthy movie source. I'm just telling you what I felt about the movie. Sorry to ruin everybody's parade. All right, guys, we've reached out part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of Rash, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? Walt Disney Pictures, Walt Disney Animation, Pixar, Marvel Studios, and Lucasfilm are all under the Disney banner. And that's partly why the studio has already broken its annual box office record. Now, according to a new report from TechCrunch, it looks as though the Mouse House could be adding Netflix's streaming service and original programming to its growing empire. TechCrunch states that Disney is now eyeing to purchase Netflix, with the rumors seeming to intensify after the announcement of AT&T's acquisition of Time Warner. Schnapp, do you buy or sell Disney buying Netflix? Boy, I'll, I personally think it would be fun, so I'll buy it because I'd like to. I, I'd love to see all of those uh, different franchises on one streaming service. I think you know Bob Iger is going to be retiring. I think later next year leaves a perfect like jumping in point for Ned Hastings, the, the guy who owns Netflix. So it could be a great situation. Jeremy. Uh, yeah, th this is the road to Skynet becoming self-aware. <laughs> seriously, this is the. I mean, this empire is just growing, growing, growing. I'll buy it. I'll buy it just fine, just because the the uh, Marvel Netflix series have been crushing it on Netflix. Yeah. Marvel linked to Disney, Disney. So I mean, it, it's a triangle that completely makes sense. Um, I don't think it's going to change a lot of what we have, but it may give us more of what we can enjoy. So I'm buying it for sure. What do you think, Mark? It's a, it's a buy for me. It's a huge buy for Netflix. I mean, if Netflix can get Disney original content to not only be on their platform, but be exclusive to Netflix, that's a huge win in a very competitive market when you just have AT&T and Time Warner teaming up with other streaming services. So for Netflix to remain the top dog, this makes a lot lot of sense for them this is a huge buy from if I'm looking at this from the perspective of Disney it would be very difficult today because you know Disney would love to have an avenue directly into their fans homes but to try to start up a new service right. in an environment where you have a Hulu where you have a Netflix where you have you know Amazon Prime where you have all that kind of stuff that would be incredibly challenging Netflix is still the king of the hill if Disney can actually acquire Netflix I have no doubt you're going to see production and ideation on various Marvel properties that we know would never get made on the big screen, but it opens up such huge avenues for them to develop a lot of things for Netflix series that we probably wouldn't even think they would do Netflix series on. It really does open the floodgates there. From a Netflix point of view, I don't know how good of a thing that is. I like As a Netflix subscriber, I don't know if I want Netflix to suddenly become all Disney all the time. 
And nothing says in this report that that's what Disney would do. Nothing says Disney will get rid of everybody else's content and just do theirs. I'm sure they wouldn't. That would be my one fear. But if you're Disney, you have to like this. If you're a shareholder in Disney, you have to like this. Let me ask you guys, because you're sports fans, like cable, as people slowly cut the cord of cable and more people go to streaming, Disney owns ESPN, and yep. ESPN has been dropping. And that's one of the mm -hmm. also things that was reported. Now, do you see if Disney appropriates Netflix, would ESPN, like sports, start becoming a bigger part of Netflix? Well, I don't know if we become a part of Netflix because I don't know if Netflix is has any plans right now to go into the live market, but already we're seeing with properties like ESPN, ESPN does have streaming services now, whether it's ESPN, <coughs> the app that you can put on your mobile devices or on your Roku or whatever, but also on like Sling TV that's in your Roku, they now have ESPN. You've just for a long time, for years now, Disney has more and more been pushing in that direction of streaming media. Mm. And I think like the type of thing you're suggesting is inevitable yeah. at this point. All right, what's next? Fox Searchlight Pictures has released a new trailer for Jackie starring Natalie Portman as the former first lady. Directed by Pablo Larine and written by Noah Oppenheim, the film stars Academy Award winner Natalie Portman in a portrait of one of the most important and tragic moments in American history seen through the eyes of the iconic first lady. The film also stars Greta Gerwig, Billy Crudup, John Hurt, and Peter Sarsgaard. It opens in theaters on December 2nd. Mark Byers saw the new trailer for Jackie. Huge buy for me, Ashley. I was I was mesmerized watching this trailer. I really was. I mean, I'm I'm very steeped in the war of JFK and Jackie and what she meant to him, what she meant to the country after JFK's assassination, and what she was going through as a human being. And that's what this felt like to me. Where something like that Steve Jobs movie that came out last year was a series of moments in his life that showed you something about the man. This is something that I think is going to be one moment in time and how that affects affects a human being psyche on a personal level, on a professional level, on a public level, and it looks like something that is a shoe in for Natalie Portman to once again get nominated and probably win an Oscar. I think it looks that good. The the tone of this thing, the the atmosphere of this trailer and what it looks like we're going to get from Natalie Portman, you got to buy it. This looks in Incredible, maybe the most intimate look at Jackie O, maybe that we've ever had on screen. At least that's what we're getting teased with in the trailers. I absolutely loved it. At this point, I'm thinking she's probably a lock for for a nomination mm -hmm. at this point too. So for me, it's a buy. What about you? For sure, huge buy. Uh, Natalie Portman's one of the best actors working. I'm not just saying that because I I she I was going to marry her for like it's a solid <laughs> decade where that was my plan. But uh, no, it, it's I mean because Jackie, you look at. She didn't see the president get assassinated. She saw her husband get murdered. And in so front she, of her. Yeah, yeah, right in front of her. And so she, as a human being, has to deal with that. And that kind of gets lost where you're like, oh, the president got assassinated. She was right in the car with him. It was like, no, her husband got killed right in front of her. Um, and then as a person, she has to deal with that. But it's not over because there's political pressure on her at this point. So she, she that's a tough balance. And that's the kind of friction in a movie that makes for good stuff. And again, like like you guys said, it's got to be nominated. Shep. Yeah, it's a it's a crushing trailer. It's an emotional trailer. I, I love the way they kind of like jump through time, even though they're going to be dealing with it seems like a several days of after the event. Um, you know, even just just simple shots that were crushing, where her taking off her blood soaked you know leggings. Yeah. It's like oh, in certain, the shower, when yeah, the blood yeah. starts coming up. There's Ooh. certain things in the in this trailer that really hit home that you've never. It's kind of a brand new look at the the at the assassination from her perspective. Mm -hmm. And also being produced by Darren Aronofsky, I felt like a little bit of that flavor in there, for mm -hmm. sure. You know, I, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think like one of the most incredible images in American history, and you think about the horror of that, I think you're right, Jeremy, I think sometimes we forget, this wasn't just somebody witnessing the assassination of a president, this was somebody watching their husband die. That scene, like the actual footage of it, when he gets shot in the head, and I believe it's Jackie, diving over to the back of the car, trying to pick up a piece of his brain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, like you, yeah. like and that's the pl place that you're in. I, I, it's just incredible to me. All right, what's next? CBS Films has released a new trailer for Patriots Day, director Peter Berg's dramatic chronicle of the Boston Marathon bombing and its aftermath. Mark Wahlberg stars as police sergeant Tommy Saunders, who joins survivors, first responders, and investigators in the hunt for the terrorists responsible for the act before they strike again. Patriots Day opens on December 21st and expands wide on January 13, 2017. John Byers saw the new trailer for Patriots Day. I'm actually going to sell the trailer, and I loved the first trailer. I absolutely loved the first trailer, and I have very little doubt that this movie is going to be great. And I don't think that the movie as a whole, when you watch it spread out over its probably two-hour runtime, that it's going to feel pandering or hitting you over the head a little bit too much. 
but I feel like they packed a lot of that into this particular trailer. Like, if you remember when we talked about the first Patriot's Day trailer, I loved it because of the subtlety in it. It was very subtle, it was very light-handed, and yet it kind of drew you into it and you loved it. This trailer, I kind of felt the opposite. I didn't feel there was any subtlety to it. I felt it was kind of heavy-handed at the one time. So the trailer kind of turned me off a little bit. But I'm sure in the movie, that's going to be spread out nice and even and going to give us a great experience. But just as a trailer, I'm going to sell it. What do you think? It's a buy for me, but it's not the resounding buy I wanted it to be for a lot of the same reasons you're talking about. I think a lot of the dialogue felt... uh, Hokey's the wrong word because I don't know if these conversations actually took place, if these actual sentences were uttered. I know it's based on a true story, and that's why I'm buying it, along with the fact that Peter Berg is directing it. I know that Peter Berg cares deeply about this story and getting the subject matter out to the public in an accurate way, as does Mark Wahlberg, who's a guy from Boston. So that's why I'm going to give it the buy. But a lot of that dialogue did feel a little movie-ish to me. Mm -hmm. As this is the first trailer I've seen for this movie, I don't have the superpower to compartmentalize the trailer from the movie. <laughs> like, if I say sell on the trailer, I feel like I'm selling the movie. The trailer interested me. Um, I, I just thought it was another, like, oh, I, all right, so they're going for Deepwater Horizon again. Then it was like, oh, no, from the star and director of Deepwater Horizon. So if they give me that in this, I'm totally buying it for sure. Schnapp. Yeah, this is the first trailer I saw for the film, and I'm buying the trailer. Um, <clears throat> I do feel a little of that procedural uh, like I'm watching a TV show, especially when they're questioning and like, we're not going to let him go. I think if they just only stuck with Mark Wahlberg and cut out all the other ancillary characters, the trailer would have been a lot stronger, but it was still strong enough to make me actually really interested in seeing the film. All right, well, listen, guys, one of the movies that opened this past weekend has got a lot of people bu- buzzing, and that's Arrival. Notice I didn't see The Arrival this time? Yeah. And that is Arrival, got a lot of people buzzing, and we were lucky enough to have the screenwriter, Eric Heiser, here in our studio to talk a little bit about Arrival. We want to share some of that conversation with you right now. How much of the alien language did you develop beyond what we see in the movie? Because that's, that's one of the most fascinating parts to me. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about the design of the language before. Right. I look at that and I kind of see a work of art that I'd probably hang on my... I, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised, actually, if people saw this movie and wound up getting tattoos. Right. Well, yeah. I am. Yeah. You're, I, I'm you, absolutely going to really? get a tattoo. Yeah. What, what word are you going to get tattooed? Uh, time. Time? Yes. Oh, I like that. But uh, I can tell you that it really the lovely thing about this film is that the script was kind of a springboard in a lot of things i could i could take it only so far um and then with denis curating all the right people for it he brought everybody on to to make the same film and that's such a crazy distinction i need to make here but if you have someone who is just trying to make either a straightforward action movie or a, a you know crazy conspiracy thriller or something else while you're while you're trying to do something um, true to what it was originally meant to do, you end up with something that's a little more convoluted. And he found everybody who knew what this story was, who knew what this movie was, and knew how to then improve it. So he got a production designer by the name of Patrice Vermette, and he and, and his wife began tackling the idea of building a legitimate alien language. Uh, he took my little circular logo rams from the screenplay, and he was like, that's a good kid. You, you, got, you did your part. I'm going to take it from here and created a a much more organic and authentic language that is actually legitimate. It's a hundred different logograms, a hundred different pieces that form a complete language. He created an alphabet in in Heptapod in a way that I didn't even uh, realize. And we had another amazing man by the name of Stephen Wolfram uh, uh, who loaned his software for some of this. And when he discovered how much work that Patrice had, had done on this language, then coded some software to help analyze and, and uh, codify that, that language, all those logograms. So there is a scene in this film where you're seeing on a, on a software, like uh, on a screen, mm-hmm. the software like decoding different words within a phrase on this alien language, and that is actually Arrival happening. is a v- That's out. not just some CGI sequence. That's actually software at work. Things are a little chaotic here today. We're all not feeling good. Don't forget, Arrival is in theaters right now. You can go and check that out right now. Hey, listen, guys, remember, we're doing this show live, which means at the end of the show, we like to save a little bit of time to take some of your live Twitter questions. You can start sending those in right now. Just make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Send them on in, and Wendy will pick out a few to ask. I also want to remind you, that Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider today. We also got Heroes with John Schnepp. Goes online around 5 p.m. Keep your eyes open for that. Also, don't forget, we've got a brand new 
movie trivia showdown team match we've got the wolves of steel taking on team real rejects yesterday we put up our brand new crash course on how do the oscar nominations work a whole lot of stuff to check out keep your eyes open there now it is time for mailbag listen if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com and Ashley, what do we got in the mailbag today? Nathan writes, hello, Collider. I saw the trailer for Valerian in the City of a Thousand Planets, and I was interested, so I did some research on the European comic series the movie is based on. I found some allegations that Star Wars plagiarized certain ideas from the comics, like Han being frozen in Carbonite. Now, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so I don't want these accusations to be true, but some of the similarities are hard to dismiss. I'm curious what you guys think. Um, I wouldn't read too much into that. I mean, look, George Lucas has always said there's a long list of things that he drew influence from, whether it's Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, whether it was Flash Gordon, whether it was... Like, there's a lot of stuff that he drew influence from. And look, you can take anything that's made today, no matter how original it might feel to you, if you go back long enough into history, whether it's through film, newspaper serials, comic books, novels, books, whatever you have, you're going to find things that have some or a lot of similarities. I wouldn't be totally shocked if that if this um, thing was another source that George Lucas drew some inspiration from. He's always talked very openly about that. But as far as there being direct like plagiarism or anything like that, I don't think so. Schnepp, what do you think about this? Yeah, I don't think uh, it's more so inspired by than plagiarized. I think you know it's well known that when Lucas was in college, he had read. A, he was a big comic book fan, and you know it's it's on the record for him saying, "I love Flash Gordon. I wanted to make Flash Gordon. Then I made Star Wars because I couldn't make Flash Gordon." Um, you know, we a lot of people have said, "Oh, he's taking a lot of stuff from uh, Jack Kirby's The New Gods." Like instead of the Source, it's the Force and the character Dark Side, and you know he's got a son and all this. There's a lot there, which you know it, it, he read that and he was inspired by it. Same with Valerian uh, or Valeria, and uh, what the the comic has like two names, but. Uh, uh, you know, the artist, I think, Ralph McQuarrie, probably also was inspired by some of those comic books. That, Like, if you look at back-to-back uh, -back comparisons of some of the designs of characters and, like, Cloud City and Star Destroyers and a whole bunch of different things, there's some inspiration there. It's nothing is plagiarized, like, oh, my God, it's, it looks exactly like Darth Vader. Nothing is... You can't, you know, you, you, you could comp compare anything, like you were saying, and there's sources of inspiration within all of it. So I wouldn't say plagiarize, I would say inspired. Jeremy. Those were two very educated answers, so I'm going to leave you with this. Um, I am interested as to when the movie comes out, if it's going to have a stigma on the movie, which would right. be unfair if the source material came first, then Star Wars, then the movie. So I want to see how people play that, but hey, man, I still like Avatar, and I dismiss all the dances with Wolfcraft that, that's <laughs> tacked onto that, so. <laughs> hey, we'll do whatever. It reminds me of some arguments I would have with friends of mine when, like, Lord of the Rings came out. Right. And then they would go, oh, my gosh, like, um, Lord of the Rings is just plagiarizing D&D. &D. Right, right. It's like, ah, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> Right. right, but it can be said that before Lord of the Rings, before J.R.R. Tolkien came around, elves built toys in Santa's workshop. <laughs> they were not warriors. So any warrior elf you've ever seen came from Lord of the Rings somehow. So there's always borrowing and trading happening, like Pokemon cards and football teams, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I know a lot about one of those things. I'm going to say plagiarism is a very strong term, yeah. and I would go more towards inspiration than anything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, even when you look back at like what George Lucas based a lot of his works on, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, it's like that th that story is told in a lot of different mediums in a lot of different forms. And even with art, it's like it, it, it depends on what the art form is as to how much inspiration you're allowed to take. Like in stand-up comedy, you, you do not take somebody's joke. Mm -hmm. You just simply don't do it. With music, a lot of times people cover songs. A lot of times people <laughs> will give them credit. A lot of times people, when you hear like, like Led Zeppelin might have stolen tunes, it's like, oh no, really? Or did they just get inspiration from listening to another band? So it's a very tricky thing, but I think in this particular case, it's inspiration and it's not plagiarism. All right, what's next? Zachary writes, Hi Collider Crew, I was re-watching The Dark Knight and was wondering what would happen if Heath Ledger didn't die. We were all sad to see him die knowing that he was a great actor. Do you think Nolan would have included him in a third Batman? movie. The Joker, I believe, was locked up in Arkham at the end of The Dark Knight, so he could have been in a later movie. I would like to hear your opinions and go Pats. You know, it's funny because, like, <laughs> Nolan himself, Christopher Nolan himself has been inconsistent with his own answer to these questions. He's talked before that, no, I already had my idea for the third film and it didn't include Joker, but then he's done interviews where he said things that made sound like, no, he very much planned on using Heath Ledger again. So I don't really know. 
Personally, I don't think they would have used the Joker again. At least not in the next Christopher Nolan movie. I think Christopher Nolan probably already had an idea for what the next chapter was, um, and he would have moved on to another character. And then maybe, maybe he might have done a fourth one had Heath Ledger still been around to draw back on that character again. But I I just don't know that he would have been in the third one. And it's hard to say at this point. Schnepp, what do you think? Well, I remember reading, you know, there's so many different theories, but I remember reading in one of the one sourced magazine where, he, where Nolan actually said, I would have had Ledger in Arkham Asylum and had Batman visiting him for and like yeah, Le- Ledger as the Joker would have like given him some clues and maybe had some kind of connective tissue with possibly the Riddler. And I'd heard that, you know, Warner Brothers was very hot on having Leonardo DiCaprio play the Riddler, whether or not that's exactly who Nolan wanted to play the Riddler. But I had heard that the Riddler was going to be that next villain and went with the death of, of Heath Ledger and them still in post-production. They were like, we're not even to think about the third movie. And so that's why he went with a totally different direction, bringing back Ra's al Ghul and bringing in Bane. What do you think? It would be hard for me to accept that Heath Ledger would have been the Joker in just a cameo. You know, I think it worked for Scarecrow in the third one, just having that little cameo where he's the judge. I don't think it would have worked, but the, the, actually, Schnepp, the scene that you're painting for me right now does have some merit. Like, if Batman goes in, because Batman and Joker have always had that relationship where they start to realize they need one another to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. So I think that Bane would have been the star of the third movie, and I think that Joker might have had that one scene, but I, I don't see that movie, or I don't see that franchise going to a fourth film anyway. What if he was like the Silence of the Lambs, where... Batman had to go and get information from him. Yeah, uh, I'm glad that you said that right before I did, John Schnepp. Thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) I I was, uh, no, but that Hannibal Lecter picture that you were painting earlier is always kind of what I had in my head. Probably a little less helpful because Joker's clearly Mm. going to mess with him. But I I, I did see a world where Joker had a hand in someone else being created. Maybe this guy, maybe the Riddler took something the Joker was going to do and he kept running with it. So Joker has all the answers, but he's Mm. not going to give them up. who knows? Like a small role, but a, but more than a cameo, like Silence of the Lambs, inspired by but not plagiarizing. Mm. All right, guys. Well, we said we take a little bit of time at the end of the show to take your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Once again, make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video. Fire in those questions, and Wendy's going to pick some out right now. So, Wendy, what have you picked out? All right. First one comes from Jalen Gittens, who writes, "If Disney bought uh, Netflix." Do you guys think that Kevin would take control of the Netflix side of Marvel? Mm. Um, nope. Yeah, nope. It would be Perlmutter. Perlmutter would take that over. Pearl, Perlmutter is still firmly in control of the tele- all things televised. Kevin Feige, remember recently they had that division of power where Kevin Feige used to report to Perlmutter. They had a lot of creative differences, so they split it up. Perlmutter is now completely in charge of all the television stuff. Kevin Feige is per- purely in t- charge of all the movie stuff, which causes a lot of complications, and right. it, it makes the future a little bit questionable. So, no, if they, I mean, the way things are right now, if it does go to Netflix, Kevin will probably not have much, if anything, to do with it. It'll probably go all under Perlmutter. What do you think? Yeah, they should do that. I mean, they should compartmentalize just for the sake of foggy sanity. My God. I mean, that's a lot of projects to take on. In the end, these are human beings who have to do management, (laughs) and people just can't do everything. So I'd say, no, it's going. Yeah, I I don't think he wants that responsibility right right now. I don't think he wants to worry about consistency between the Netflix universe and what's going on in the MCU, even though they're all in one big, kind of thing it's it's tough when you have like all of these things going on with even something like the actual network tv shows like agents of shield and how hard they're pushing in humans and how that might not be a movie anymore so i think kevin feige would rather stick to just the studio yeah i mean it's a win-win situation if, if disney does buy netflix then we're going to get all of those kevin feige marvel films on netflix mm-hmm. eventually and we and you know i think uh Perlmutter and uh and a uh, uh, jeff jeff Lo- oh. jeff Loeb, they're doing mm-hmm. a good job with the uh, defenders and daredevil all the netflix stuff is just incredible so yeah they're doing a great job also star wars it's hard to find star wars streaming on content that's not a star wars or, or it's not a disney website like they're the, mm. st- the star wars movies are not streaming on anything that you don't have to buy or rent the star wars movies for a price for like 15 to 20 bucks mm. so that'd be cool for them to come to netflix it would be awesome for disney to do that remember when disney used to really hold you hostage with their classic animated movies <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They were releasing it from the vault. Yeah, 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 it's coming out from the vault. The Little Mermaid. Two weeks, and then you're never going to get to touch it again. It's like, what? Wait, wait, what? It's gone? No, it's not gone. <laughs> All right, what's next? All right, Chris Hartwell writes, love your crash courses. Ever thought of doing one on reshoots just to help clarifying something that is so often misconstrued? Wow, that is a great idea for Crash Course. Yes. By the way, if you're not checking out our Crash Course video series, you really should. There's a playlist on our main channel. 
check it out. They're super great and informative. Uh, Perry Nimeroff is kind of our producer of those things. And everybody from Mark and, and myself and a b whole bunch of people around here have a hand in the writing of them, and they turn out great. And the one we just put out with Kenny Napsok doing their narrating on how do Oscar nominations work is really entertaining. I think that's a really good suggestion for one mm -hmm. uh, we could do. Would you think some, that's one we should Reshoots do? Reshoots is great. I mean, there's so many different ways people, oh, oh the, whole, the movie's going to suck now. They're going back to Reshoots. And we've talked about this time and time again. Like, sometimes they go back to Reshoots to try to fix something, and there's no way to fix it. It just comes out like a hobbled creature. Other times, they're like, they've had it planned the whole time. Like, hey, we noticed this scene wasn't working. Let's go back because we have that two weeks that we've scheduled for pickups a la reshoots let's add that totally awesome scene that would have never happened if they didn't get into the pro you know the editing process so i think it's a it's a great one yeah handle. we put that vid out like the day before rogue one comes out then we see rogue one and it's like so obvious that they did <laughs> forrest whitaker completely different hair in one yeah. scene yeah. <laughs> What do you think? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll say that uh, How the Oscars Work video is one of the most helpful videos for cinephiles out there. I actually tweeted it last night. I was like, no, nah, it's just good. It's just really <laughs> helpful and good. And I like that suggestion because it, it, it shows that those videos aren't only just, oh, this is what this villain is or that villain is, which is great to know, but how the movie industry works. I think reshoots is a supreme idea. That's a good idea. <laughs> Halfway through the movie, Jyn Erso is now played by Patton Oswalt. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? What happened? <laughs> All right, what's next? I want to see that one. <laughs> Steven Slatter writes, do you like fourth wall breaking movies? If so, what is your favorite? Mine is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I mean, well, I mean, that was great. I mean, but here's one of those things. It, it, fourth wall breaking doesn't make a movie good and it doesn't make a movie mm -hmm. bad. The movie's going to be good or the movie's going to be bad and then the fourth wall breaking can play a part of that. Obviously, they did a great job with it in Ferris Bueller's. They did a fantastic job with it in Deadpool. When used correctly and used right, it can be quite good. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the 80s and early 90s, a lot of movies used that fourth wall break. Oh, hello. You might be wondering why I'm in this position right now. That's like, right. They did that a lot, and it was kind of overused for a period of time. But it's like anything else. It's like saying, are comedies good or comedies bad? Depends on the comedy. Depends on how it's used. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, what's that movie with uh, McAvoy where he can curve bullets? Oh, wanted. 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 Yeah. One of my favorite fourth wall breaking moments at the very end of that, that bullet's going backwards, and he looks at the camera and he goes, what the fuck have you done lately? <laughs> it's like one of my favorite, because he lists like, oh, I did this, this, that, that, that. And it really makes you go, you know what? I should get inspired to do something in my life, you know? Um, but I completely agree with you. Like anything, any trope, any gimmick used for a movie, it is only a gimmick if the movie itself isn't good. The movie itself will have to have to validate the fourth wall breaking, right. not the other way around. Um, but yeah, if, I mean, <laughs> the end of Ferris Bueller is just fantastic, which inspired the end and post credit scene of Daredevil. Or Daredevil, which oh, or not Daredevil. Daredevil. Deadpool. Deadpool, yeah. Yeah, I never really considered Ferris Bueller breaking the fourth wall because we never had a fourth wall there to begin with. Like right when the movie right. opens, he's talking to us. Yeah. So we just feel like we're members. But there's a lot of great comedies that have a lot of great fourth wall breaking scenes. Here's a few of my favorites. Animal House, when John Belushi is looking into the sorority oh, house. So he, yeah. he gives you the wink. There's a... Uh, 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 Hot Shots Part Du when at the end of the movie uh, dude just looks at the camera and he says war it's fantastic I love that scene I love in uh, Airplane when he looks at the camera and he says what a pisser mm -hmm. but my favorite fourth wall break of all time is in Coming to America Eric LaSalle is in a compromising position and he just looks at the camera and he just <laughs> it's so funny I was going to say, I'm wearing the shirt, Young Frankenstein, also any Mel Brooks yeah. film, pretty much an airplane as well. But Mel Brooks usually loves breaking the fourth yeah. wall, even if it's one scene with Young Frankenstein, Martin Marty Feldman. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I just thought of Spaceballs when they fast forward to the present. And they're <laughs> like, <laughs> that's right. That's one yeah. of the that's best one of the things greatest. I've ever when seen. When is now? Soon. <laughs> <laughs> when is now now? All right, what's next? AJ Rose writes, with the recent news about the MCU and Fox, what would a future trade of characters you'd like to see happen? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different things, but it's important to keep keep in mind, though, we are dealing with sub-lower-level characters that, most, that these studios were probably never planning on using in the first place. So, like, look, I am one of these people, I know there's a huge movement out there, people say, give X-Men back to Fox, give this back to Fox, or give, give X-Men back to Marvel, give everything back to Marvel. And I, I'm still in the position that I do not like that idea. When everything is under one roof, we are going to get, there's nobody pushing Marvel mm -hmm. anymore if it's all under one roof. 
we're going to get a lot more limited number of movies. We never would have got Deadpool in the first place. Like right. if, if Marvel if Marvel had reacquired all the X Men stuff, that amazing Deadpool movie never would have happened. We never would have got that. Um, Days of Future Past, X Men One, X Men Two, Logan, the the first couple of Spider Man movies, the first Amazing Spider Man movie. You know, the upcoming Logan is a movie that Marvel never would have done, mm. and I mean, we don't know if that's good or bad or not at this point. So. When I think about things like Sea Traded, I would probably have to think about it to go down into the real lower levels again to say, oh, this is a little obscure character Marvel would probably never use, but it would probably come in handy for the X-Men at some point. I would have to think about it. Do you have any off the top of your head, Schnepp? You know what? I'm with you with X-Men. I would like Fox to hold on to X-Men and the whole slew of all the characters that come with the X-Men universe for the simple reason of what you just said. We get more movies. We get that break from like, hey, look, here's all the MCU films. And at the same time, we can have a couple of X-Men movies being released within a couple uh, months or even a couple weeks of each other. Creates good competition. The one film series of characters that I want to return back to Marvel is the Fantastic Four and their entire rogues gallery, Doctor Doom, Galactus, Silver Surfer. I think the trade would be the greatest trade that we could possibly see. Speaking of sports, it would be like, look, you get to have all your toys and video games and action figures. We'll let you have all that tasty money from the X-Men. Give us back the Fantastic Four. I'm hoping that that behind the scenes thing is happening for Phase Four. And when it's announced and it's not happening, this guy will be crying in a corner like a little baby. <laughs> but you know what? I still have dreams. What do you think, Mark? You just wonder when that phone rings and what those conversations are like. I'm thinking big right now. I'm thinking big. I am thinking sports terms. I'm thinking what is the biggest name in the Fox property line right now? It's Wolverine, okay? So we want to get the character of Wolverine into the Marvel MCU. So what do we trade? What do we need to give up in the MCU to give over to Fox? I'm going to give you a Hawkeye. I'm going to give you uh, Vision. Um, they can make a cool movie together. I'll throw some <laughs> Ultron in there. I'll throw uh, two villains to be named later because we know the MCU doesn't really throw. You know what? I will give you Red Skull. If you act right now, I will give you Red Skull back over there if we get Wolverine in an MCU movie. For they would say the absolutely no. <laughs> the, the, all those characters yeah. do not equal Wolverine. They they hung up as soon we as get Captain Wolverine. America, you get Wolverine. No! It no, has to no. be on that level. Yeah. You offered them a robot that's already been defeated and dead. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but they they get the rights to it, so they, they could take like Quicksilver and they could like do something else with it. You know? I love the fact that Schnepp and I today are on the same page because Dr. Victor Von Doom is one of the greatest villains in the Marvel Universe. Yeah. I've never seen him done well on the screen. I want to see him done well on the screen. And you bring up a good uh, point about escalation and uh, a competitive market. You know, if everything's under the same umbrella, then people start phoning it in. As uh, like back in the early 2000s when you had NFL 2K and Madden, and then like you know they were all <laughs> yeah. trying to up each other at NFL 2K4. Rem Remains one of the greatest football games of all time. Madden has never beaten it because Madden then was like, hey, we're the only ones around. Whatever. We can just phone it in. So I don't want to see that happen, but I do want to see the Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom get a fair shot. Mm -hmm. Remember an NFL Blitz? Yeah. Oh yes, Remember that game yeah. that, that doesn't fly in the modern, you know, the modern landscape of you know not wanting to promote concussions. But <laughs> NFL Blitz is a fun game to play. All right, last question of the day. All right, last one comes from Xander Tanigawa, who writes: Between movies and TV shows, which side do you hate when it ends with a cliffhanger? Oh gosh, um, I, you know, with with television. You have a shorter wait mm -hmm. that you have to you have to wait for. So I, I suppose that that. But there's also a, a little implied pissed offness that I have too. It's like, you know, I've just invested sixteen hours, twelve hours, twenty two hours this year watching your show. Give me something satisfying for that at the end of it. You know, like a lot of the Walking Dead fans were understandably really pissed off at the end of last season with that Negan thing, right? They're like, hey, we have been here following you week in, week out, blah, 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 and you ended the season with that? You can't do that. They were really upset. So, I don't know. I'm kind of torn on that. What do you think? I think you bring up a great point where that was my first go-to, where I was like, if a movie ends off in a cliffhanger, you are waiting a couple years before you get that resolution. A show, ah, eh, two to three months. So I would say a show is better, but I was one of the people, I actually wasn't pissed about the Walking Dead cliffhanger because I was there in Star Trek The Next Generation when Jean-Luc Picard was assimilated into the Borg Collective That's right. and Riker said, Mr. Worf, fuck Fire, mm. and he was going to kill him and then it said to be continued I have never been so shell shocked since then <laughs> in my life mm. nothing on TV phases me and I'm like every time there's a huge cliffhanger I'm like it's not as much as Star Trek The Next Generation I can promise you that <laughs> I remember one of the biggest cliffhangers I remember being in the theater it was like my second viewing of the first Lord of the Rings film uh, the Fellowship of the Ring and you could tell there was a bunch of people in that theater who had not read the books and that's cool and when it got to that scene mm -hmm. where Sam and Frodo 
walk over that one little ledge and they can see Mordor off in the distance. And then the credits started mm. to roll. And it was like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. Everybody <laughs> lost <laughs> their minds in so that true. theater at that point. <laughs> anyway, what, what are some big cliffhanger stuff for you? For me, The Empire Strikes Back, I actually loved that cliffhanger. I saw it as a mm -hmm. little kid and it made me, I could not wait those, and I had to, and all of us had to wait those two and a half years for Return of the Jedi to see how are they gonna save Han Solo and all these different things, mm -hmm. you know? And it, that that led to such a high level of excitement, at least for our, myself and all the people who went and saw Return of the Jedi, because we knew we were gonna get that conclusion. I think when movies do that, I think it's worth the wait. I right. think because we know, oh, in a year or two years, we're gonna see that conclusion. With television, sometimes, I mean, it could be a shorter wait, but it's more irritating just because you've just put in those 16 hours. And they're like, I got to wait a year. You're like, Grr! it's like for some reason it hurts a little bit more because of the extra amount of time. Yeah, it's a good Tom Petty song, but I actually am a huge fan of anticipation. I really am. It sounds like a weird thing to say, but the tantric experience of waiting for art to pay off or not pay off, I think is, is one of the best things about what we do. With TV, I love that The Walking Dead had a cliffhanger. I love that we come to expect that from Walking Dead now. I love that The Force Awakens ended with a cliffhanger. Mm. You know, yeah. we're, we're, we're waiting for a guy to talk and he doesn't talk. And so now we got to wait two years to see what comes out of his mouth. I love that experience with movies. So I'm cool with it in TV or film. But there lies the genius of the ending of The Empire Strikes Back. Because on the one hand, you have this great cliffhanger. Han Solo is taken. But it came hand in hand with a satisfying re uh, resolution. Leia and Luke escape Cloud mm -hmm. City. He gets his hand fixed. He had that confrontation with Vader. So they tied in a cliffhanger with a satisfying ending all at the same time. Totally. It was absolutely brilliant, and you don't see that accomplished very often. All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? On Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. You can find me here at Pasadena Designer Con this weekend on the 19th and 20th. I'm going to be uh, premiering a bunch of weird statues like Unicrom. Come check me out at Booth 804. And you got a little show dropping today, too. That's right. Also, thanks, John Campia. <laughs> <laughs> Collider Heroes today, a little bit after 5. You might have to have some patience, 5.15, 5.30. Get sweaty with me today. Mr. Jeremy Johns, where can people find you? People can find me on a, is that my camera right there? Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> I, I, the whole we got time, the been, whole show. I've been like looking at that light, like that's ah, kind of in between. I'm pretty sure that's fine. Uh, you can find me uh, at the grocery store in the Dayquil aisle. I'll be loading up today. But if you want to see me online, you can find me at YouTube, Instagram, and uh, Twitter. That's the other one, at Jeremy Johns, and on Facebook, at Real Jeremy Johns. Stop it. Mark, how you doing? You laughing? <laughs> Mr. Mark Ellis. I'm doing great, Jeremy Johns. You can find me in San Diego this weekend, Friday and Saturday. I'm at the Comedy Store in La Jolla. You can get tickets at MarkEllisLive.com. At MarkEllisLive is my Twitter handle where I currently put up a poll as to what you think my new tattoo is. Ashley Mubba found out I have a tattoo last night, so now I have, a, I have to expose it to the world, and uh, there's four choices to bet on. Ooh. What do you think is going to I win? still like the idea of baby carrots right below your belt line. It could be a baby carrot. Drop baby carrots. It's, it's not below my belt line, but it could be a baby carrot. Sitting over there. Miss Ashley Bam Bam Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? You guys can find me escaping the germs of these sickos on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And of course, Wendy Lee. You can find me far, far away from these sickies and uh, taking a lot of vitamin C's. Also on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. You can find me curled up on the couch in my office, sleeping for the next three hours, cursing the day I was born. You can also follow me on Twitter, and Facebook, and Instagram simply at John Campy. Special thanks to all the guys in the room for making this technically possible to even happen and thank you to you guys for making us a part of your day we'll be back tomorrow hopefully feeling a little bit a little bit better so until next time bye bye hey guys if you <laughs> like this video click the thumbs up button also make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel it'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at collider